there were three earthly authorities God used to rule over Israel. The priests, the prophets, and the kings. Who were the priests? What is the priesthood? The priesthood began in Mount Sinai when God gave the law. He also gave the instructions on how to build the tabernacle. Then God ordained at Mount Sinai the Levites to be the priests. It was a corporate priesthood. That means all the sons of Levi, they were incorporated to become ministers, to become his servants. However, the Levites weren't the first people who functioned as priests. There were individual priests mentioned earlier in the scriptures. Now, for example, who was the first priest? Abel was the first priest. He offered sacrifice that was acceptable by God way back in Genesis chapter 4. When Abel died, Seth took over his priestly ministry. And then you have Noah. Noah was a priest. After the flood, he offered sacrifices that was accepted by God. And then there was Abraham who offered sacrifices to God. Now, Abraham was a priest. Then Melchizedek was called the priest of the Most High God. There were always priests from Abel onward. The Levites were not the original, the first priests. There always have been priests. The priests were the ones who stood before God to receive divine revelations and later express them to the people. So they are to stand before the Lord. We see this very clearly demonstrated by the priest Eliezer. He stood before the Lord to receive God's divine instruction and then he expressed it clearly to Joshua, the leader. And upon hearing the word, Israel did according to whatever the priest Eliezer said. The priesthood was a means of divine government. God led the people through the priesthood. How did God do it? Their job was twofold. The priest brought the people to the presence of God through the offering of sacrifice. Then the priest brought the expression of God's purposes to the people. The priest stood before the Lord, received the revelation, and then the priest come before the people and expressed the instruction to the people. God governed Israel for many, many years through the priesthood. And whenever the priesthood backslide, God will raise up the prophetic ministry. He would then govern Israel through the prophets. Samuel was such a prophet. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He was a prophet priest. He was a special prophet priest. He functioned in both ministries. Now, what is the prophetic ministry? Samuel was what you call in the Old Testament a seer. As a prophet, he saw open visions. He can see. A real prophet, they see with their eyes open. They see visions. And he could see into the future. Today, we have a lot of self-appointed prophets. A lot of them, they move by impressions. All of us can move by impressions. But a real prophet, they see visions with their eyes open. They see things as clearly as you and I see each other. So they were called seers in the Old Testament. Like the priestly ministry, the prophetic ministry was also both individual and corporate. For example, Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible. He had a son who was called Methuselah. Methuselah means when he dies, the flood will come. And Methuselah lived 969 years. 1,000, almost 969 years before the flood came. Enoch saw into the future of a global flood and called his son that name. He said when he dies, the flood will saturate the whole earth. Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible. Although he lived almost 6,000 years ago, he foretold the second coming of Jesus. In Jude 14, it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch didn't see, just see the first coming. He saw the second coming. He said, Jesus Christ will come back. He's, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the, re, the second coming of Jesus Christ with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible. God called Abraham a prophet. So Abraham was also a prophet priest. 
Moses was recognized as a prophet. Elijah was a prophet. Elisha was a prophet. The prophetic ministry could be embodied in an individual, but it's not just individual. It can also be corporate. It can move in a corporate way, a corporate prophetic anointing. Samuel started a special school of the prophets for the corporate body. This is the first school in the Bible, the school of the prophets. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there to the city, you will meet a group of prophets. This is not individual prophets, it's a corporate group of prophets. Coming down from the high place with a string instrument, a tambourine, a flute, a harp, before them, they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was, when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Now, who is this guy? His name was Saul, okay? Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people say to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? Notice, Saul met a group of prophets. Prophets often move in groups to act as checks and balances to each other. Prophecies must be tested. Nobody can give a 100% prophecy, accurate prophecy all the time. We prophesy in part, the Bible says. We know in part. If one prophet's prophecy got all out of line, another prophet can come along and correct him. Samuel established this special school of the prophets in his hometown, Ramah. Samuel came from Ramah. So after Shiloh was being destroyed, he went back to Ramah and he opened a special school, the special school of the prophets. How does a prophet move in prophecy? Verse 6 gives us the answer. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Prophecy is the result of an anointing. It is only when the Spirit of God comes upon you that you begin to have the words to say. Prophecy is not you saying things that people want to hear in the natural. Prophecy is the result of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. All right, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you begin to prophesy. You begin to have the words to say. How do you receive the anointing to prophesy? By being with a prophet. Paul or Saul started to prophesy only when he was in a company of prophets at Ramah. Verse 10, when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people say to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So the people were shocked. If you want to move in prophecy, you're going to hang around other prophets. Samuel established this school because to be a prophet, you need training. You need accountability. 1 Corinthians 14 says that every prophecy must be judged. In other words, if you are not careful, you can prophesy in the flesh. A good example, last year when we had the prophecy there's going to be an earthquake. We have a prophecy that Singapore is going to be invaded by Indonesia and stuff like that. The result of that prophecy, it wasn't really a moving of the Holy Spirit. It was because some pastors heard in the grapevine some gossips in the marketplaces. And they began to say it as a thus saith the Lord. 
But it was not a thus saith the Lord. It was thus saith the grapevine and the gossipers. It was after 911. So everybody was in a state of panic. So everybody was imagining all kinds of doomsday thing that's going to happen. I was in a room and this guy was saying this. Oh, thus saith the Lord, an earthquake is going to come. I asked him. I said, are you telling me this true story? Are you telling me this is what God said to you? He said, yes. In my heart, I said, no. I took seven days and I went in prayer. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And then I felt the Lord told me this. It is not going to happen. Every prophecy must be judged. If you are naive and you see somebody who calls himself Reverend Irrelevant, oh, I am the prophet of God. And I see this. I see this. I see this all the time. I've been in full-time ministry for so long. People saying, well, you know, you got to believe that word. I say, why? Because he, he's a real prophet. I say, how do you know? Well, in his card, he says, I'm a prophet. Everybody can say whatever they want. That is why you need checks and balances. In the multitude of counselors, there are safety. God doesn't do anything unless he tells it to a few people. If what he's saying is real, then God must be saying to a number of people. You know what I did? I left the meeting and I went into my prayer closet. I said, God, I want to repent of all my sins. I said, because if you are doing something so great that's going to affect my life, affect my family, affect my church, and you're not telling me, I must have really missed you big time, you know. So I began to pray. I said, God, if there's anything, God, why is it this way? Why is it that you talked to that guy and you didn't talk to me? I said, God, I'm sorry. If I miss you, if I have too many things clogged in my ears, if I have not been sensitive enough, God, you forgive me. I prayed, I confessed the blood, I did everything. And then for seven days, I said, God, tell me, is it going to happen or not? Because if it's going to happen, then I'm your servant, right? Then you should tell me. On the seventh day, God told me, it is not going to happen. You need to judge a prophecy. If you're not careful, you can prophesy in the flesh. The principle is this. If you feel God has called you to a particular gifting, you have to move with an operator of that gift. Saul became a prophet because he moved with the prophets. If you want to be an evangelist, hang around evangelists. If you want to be a pastor, hang around pastors. If you want to be a musician, hang around musicians. If you want to be a song leader, mix with other song leaders. If you want to be a Bible teacher, hang around other Bible teachers. If you feel God has called you to a particular gifting, you have to move an operator of that gift. You need training. You need schooling. No matter how anointed you feel you are, you need supervision by other more anointed operators of that gift. God has left Shiloh. He's moving to Kerja Jerim. So all of us need training. God is going to work through you. You are going to do far more than some of the clergy that are stuck behind their desk. You are in the marketplaces. You are reaching out to the people in the world. You need training. So you say, Pastor, you know, I am so blessed. It's Tuesday I came, tonight I came. I learned so much already. Can you imagine? If you come for 10 months, Samuel moved in the priestly, the prophetic, and the kingly anointing. He was the undisputed spiritual leader of Israel. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see the people rejecting the leadership of Samuel because he was old and there was no one capable of succeeding him. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says in verse 1, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Now, by the way, J O E L is pronounced as Joel, it is not Joel. He had two sons, and he made them judges. But what kind of sons were they? Verse 3 But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel committed the same mistake as Eli. The former high priest. Samuel was one of the most perfect men in the whole Bible. He hardly had any personal flaw except this one thing that became his only black mark in his ministry. You see, Samuel grew up in a temple. Eli was the closest example of a father to him. And how many of you know Eli was a bad example of a father? Just like Eli. 
He appointed his sons into top leadership, although his sons were unspiritual and dishonest. So here you see a principle, light begets light. There's a truth in life. If change doesn't come from the top by revelation, it will come from the bottom by revolution. This is true, not just in the church. It is true in your business. It is true in your family. It is true in governments, in kingdoms, in nations. If change doesn't come from the top, voluntarily by revelation, it comes from the bottom by violent revolution. We see this in the former Soviet Union. We see this in Indonesia. We see this in East Timor. We see this in Tiananmen Square. If change doesn't come from the top by revelation, then the people at the ground, they are going to revolt. They're going to split. Uh, they're going to fight. And they're going to bring forth a revolution. Samuel was a spiritual man, but not his sons. Samuel was appointed by God, but not his sons. And Samuel failed to discipline and remove his sons when they took bribes and perverted justice. Exactly the same thing Eli did. So let's go to verse 4 right now. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. It is true that Samuel was old, but he was still sharp spiritually. He was not like Eli in that respect. Eli became fleshly, overweight, and he, he lost his vision. But Samuel was still spiritually sharp. Although he was old, he was still sharp. He was still a righteous leader. He was still a good leader. But the people were using the failure of his two sons as an excuse to force him out of power. They wanted a king just like the heathens around them. A king would not be like a prophet or a priest. He may be popular, great personality, talented, but he wouldn't be that spiritual. God wanted Israel to be led by spiritual leaders. Look with me at verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they say, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Remember, I told you, you've got to be very careful when you relate to authorities. If you show a bad attitude against an authority, you are not just insulting him, you are insulting God, because all authority is ordained by God. So all authorities were from God. And when the people rejected Samuel, they were actually rejecting God himself. So you've got to be very careful how you treat God's leaders. Now look with me at verse 8. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and serve other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. You must be very careful when you want something badly from God. God is going to give it to you. However, you must be ready to face up to the consequences. That is why when you pray, you must pray according to the will of the Lord. Sometimes when your prayers don't come to pass, it may be because it is not God's best plan for you. If you insist, even if it's bad for you, God is going to grant you your wish. Psalms 106 and verse 15, And God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. So God can give you your request if you want it badly enough. But you know what? The consequence is you will start dying on the inside. How careful we must be when we pray. You know, we must make sure that our desires, the desires of our heart, are in line with the will of God. God didn't want them to have a king. But they fought for a king. And all of a sudden, God granted them their desires. But it is out of the will of the Lord, and you will have to live with regrets for the rest of your life. You know, sometimes I've seen young men, young women, and they like this person but it's not God's will for them. 
But they say, look, I sat down. The first time we sat, we have the same thing. We felt the same way. You know, we have the same vision. It must be the will of the Lord because of so many people that day at the bus stop, why must it be Him? And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And they say, it must be a miracle. And they go for it. And they live with regrets for all their lives. I pray God give us wisdom tonight. The people wanted a king, just like the pagans around them. Somehow people find security in bondage. They find security in bondage. So God say, fine. But he wanted Samuel to warn them of the consequences first. So let's look at verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. In other words, you're, not going, you're going to lose your freedom. You're going to be in bondage. He will take your sons and appoint them to be his own chariots and to be his own horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties and will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And some will make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day, because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. So Samuel gave the warning, but the people refused to listen. Verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So what did God do? Verse 22. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. If you want it, you can have it, but it is out of the will of God. How was the kingdom birth? The kingdom was born because no one was able to take over the Nazarite priesthood. Samuel trained up a lot of prophets, but he didn't have a successor. That is why discipleship is so important. He trained up a lot of prophets, but he didn't disciple a spiritual son. The people could have prayed for God's solution. For God's intervention. They could have gone the spiritual way, but instead they went the fleshly way. They wanted to have a nation just like the heathens around them. And the result was they lived with regrets for the rest of that generation. I pray tonight that you'll be so careful. Wherever we got desire in our heart, and you know faith means you've got to have a desire. You've got to seek the mind of the Lord. You've got to be specific. You've got to be persistent. And we pray and we say, God, we like this thing. We believe this from you. And when we are not sure, we say, God, we are not sure, we put it before you. If it is your will, if it is your purpose, open doors for us. But if it is not, take away the desires from our heart. Because I don't want to do anything out of the will of God. Because I know if I pray hard enough, God can give it to me. And what he gives to me, if it is not in his will, I will live with regrets for the rest of my life. That whatever you pray is always in line with the will of God. But what does that mean? That means you've got to have a relationship with the Lord. That means that it is not enough just to have second-hand revelation from other people, other Christians. You must know God for yourself. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.